think it was March, I think. Yeah. Oh, we're live. Oh my goodness me. How long, how, you guys can keep talking. I'm just pushing yeah. all the buttons. Time, what is time anyway now? It's all been forwarded. Yeah, true. Okay. It's true. I didn't know um, where. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to the What's On at Elephant Castle Facebook page. Um, I am Nick, and there's Melissa, and joining us is Dr. Misha Jervis. Hello. Misha, how are you? I'm Hi. good. Lovely to be with you today. Mm -hmm. um, we were just trying to figure out how long it's been since we've been together. Um, it's been a while, hasn't it? Uh, I think it has. Uh, too long. Too long. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to ask Melissa to change her view because she started this video. So it's on like speaker thing. What do so you want me to do? change it to gallery. Oh, okay. Okay. Done. Done. And uh, it should now work. Um, yeah. So it's been a crazy year, uh, Misha. I know we've, everyone's been through so much. There's been all of these challenges of of, of this virus and work and, and what's been going on. But, um, you know, you were with us right at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. And, um, and we spoke, uh, you know, about, well, we spoke about a lot of things, but really kind of, well, first of all, just introduce yourself. Let everybody know, know who you are. Okay. Yes. Who am I? What I've, got to, I've, got, I've got to remember what hat I'm wearing today, but in yeah. general terms, um, I am a sports psychologist. I um, work in many different settings. Um, I work with um, elite athletes. I work in a football club. I work at Brunel University with postgraduate students. So I'm a lecturer, academic researcher. Um, and more recently, I've been working with the British Athlete Commission. And, and this is a piece of work that I'm so proud of. Um, you, you may have seen in the press the, the abuse that has been um, kind of uncovered and um, there's now um, an investigation into the culture of gymnastics, elite gymnastics and the abuse and it, this is something that I wrote about over 20 years ago um, mm. and something as an ex-international gymnastics coach I was well aware of. Um, but I've been working with um, the British Athlete Commission to deliver group therapy sessions to ex-gymnasts and actually parents of ex-gymnasts who have been through abuse. And, um, and we've also been creating some resources for them so that people can understand what emotional abuse like, looks like within gymnastics. Um, so yeah, that piece of work is something I'm very proud of. And um, it started to come to fruition in August, I guess, Nick. Um, and so um, that's, I, that's, that's what's new. Maybe that's what you don't know about me, mm. um, what I've been doing this in the last few months. That's, yeah, I mean, I remember there was a documentary on Netflix about what was going on in the United States with their uh, gymnastics program and the Olympic Committee and the, the physiotherapist, the doctor that you know, people put a lot of trust in. But it, it's, some, it's something that because we always think of what's happening in America, it doesn't happen over here, you know, because it's so big and massive and the college system is so huge over there that um, it was really, what was it that- um, Called that Athlete kind of, A, that film, yeah. Mm, yeah, what was it over here that brought it to- um, So interesting. Apart from the fact that you've been on it for 20 years, but- Well, what sure, recently? you know, but, but nobody really listening, interestingly, um, you know, and um, I, tried to call it out many times I've written about it I've researched about it um, but actually athlete a was the catalyst over here um, for many of the gymnasts who watched it and they're going me too not necessarily sexual abuse but just the culture the culture of control the emotional abuse that they they went through so um, it developed and, and I guess this is when social media is used for the good you know, um, and people connected and actually um, realized that British gymnastics, um, their complaint system was woefully inadequate um, and that people were not being heard, people were not being taken seriously. So in a sense, it was taken out of their hands and the British Athlete Commission have done an amazing job in actually um, fielding all of the, the individual complaints and also hearing the stories and 
I partnered with them and, and I suggested that possibly we could do some group therapy for these, for these individuals. And that's what we've been doing. And some of the feedback that we've got has been so lovely um, where people have said, this is the first time that people have actually taken my experiences as a, as a gymnast seriously and have actually labeled what I experienced as abuse. And mm. that, that in of itself was just so validating and, and so powerful. So yeah, that's kind of how that came about really. What was it like, I, you might've referred to this, but I, I think I missed it. What was it, or what was the process like in terms of telling, reaching athletes and saying, this is what we're gonna do? Did you find resistance, fear? Like, I don't wanna open that, I don't wanna call it abuse. What was that process like? So, yeah, interesting. So actually, almost the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's that actually it, it was liberating because when you, because people trivialize what they've been through and they go, ah, it wasn't that bad. Oh yeah, you got shouted at, but they don't understand the damage that emotional abuse does because it's like a tap, drip, drip, drip. Here's a little bit of belittlement. Here's a bit of humiliation. Here's a yelling at, here's making you feel less than, his disempowerment and and that just damages your self-esteem in in ways that are unheard of in you know that and stays with you for, for for many many years so actually when you say no 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 you were abused mm. gives like a very different perspective um and people actually go oh okay yeah, this, this is important. This is, not, this is not something that's trivial. And also, I am not responsible for this. Someone mm. did this to me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's... It gives them a kind of framework and some context to like make sense of their experience within this kind of setting rather than a, it's something that's wrong with me. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then the group therapy works beautifully because then people are hearing other people's stories. And so then that's, they're not feeling alone anymore. You know, yeah. it's like, Oh, Oh, that happened to you as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's credit to the British athlete commission that they got this up and running and um, we've done, I don't know, 10 or so sessions so far and we're, we're going to roll out and do and do more as the year progresses. It makes me wonder um, what the what, like. What are the parameters, and what or where does it say that something starts as abuse? You know, like where, like with regards to athlete A and the Olympic gymnastics. You know, it was it was obviously sexual abuse, mm. but you know, you talk about how how coaches and even parents can degrade athletes and say you're not good enough and you got to try harder. Mm. Like what, like uh, in your experience, wh where does abuse start? So I think again, this is why. Um, understanding emotional abuse is so difficult because it's not concrete you know physical abuse yes yeah, someone hit me bam mm. you can see it and 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 you know within the context of covid and within the context of lives that people might be listening to you but they're not in a sports setting but they're living their lives to understand whether they are actually experiencing emotional abuse from maybe a family member or a partner um so there are kind of eight key behaviors that are indicative of emotional abuse. And if you're experiencing these on a regular basis, so if you're being belittled, humiliated, if you're being isolated or rejected, you know, you're not validated, all of those little things. If you feel like you have to walk on eggshells around somebody, you know, you're never quite sure if you're going to get it right. Um, mm. Those behaviors are emotionally abusive behaviors um, and the thing is is that in elite sport as, as you know Nick because there's a culture of compliance and there's a culture that says well either, you, either this is this is elite sport either you sign up to it or you can't be in it mm -hmm. um, people think that well somehow they shouldn't be feeling less than worthless belittled they should be tough enough to deal with this somehow. And that's the myth that they've been um, sold really. You know? um, and parents in a sense become complicit with that, whereby they say, well, if you want to get to the Olympics, this is what it takes. Yeah. 
which is of course a lie. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're, you're right. A lot of it is a lie and a lot of it is just through, it's not through, you know, I just think about like, you know, and we know our, like, you know, my story and stuff and, and we talk about it, even just being a young kid uh, mm -hmm. in a, in a very physical game where you're taught that, you know, you're not allowed to cry. Yep. And even just that, and I love the way, you know, you just explained it to me once you're like, Nick, you're telling, you're teaching a kid who's eight years old, who has an enlarged amygdala, the sense of, you know, that part of the brain. Yep. And you're telling them to suppress an emotion that is naturally there to protect them. Yep. Um, and I know both of you have a lot of experience with people who have had that trauma from a young age, mm -hmm. uh, where again, we're suppressing emotions. We're not allowing ourselves to, to, um, to, for our body to have its natural expression. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, and I know you know what we're doing with tender is the new tough and trying to readdress all of these things. And, and how, what's a good way for it to start? What's a good way for it to start for people to start challenging these old ideas that even if it's just like, it's, you're not allowed to cry in sport. Yeah. Hmm. So I think, I think it's different for boys. I think it's more challenging for boys actually than for girls. And I think, you know, one of the things that I do when I'm working with younger kids is that I give them emotional literacy because they don't, they don't even have the language to start explaining what they're feeling because you're right, Nick, they've just been told suppress it. So they, they can tell you basically two emotions, angry, uh -huh. but just angry, not, not the subtleties of what lives in what that spectrum of anger, you know, from rage to frustration to irritation. Do you know what I mean? It's just anger. Um, to sadness, loneliness, being forlorn, feeling alone. And, and these emotions may well be some of the emotions that people are experiencing now, you know, as again, we're in, we're in this lockdown. Um, so if you don't have the language to access your emotions, you, you act it out, you play it out it, it it will always come out but not always in a way that is constructive <laughs> helpful sometimes it's self-destructive you know those kind of self-sabotaging behaviors that we get into and you know um sometimes those behaviors are are the are the only sign that the outside world has that an individual is actually in pain really in pain but often what comes with that is judgment of the behavior rather than asking questions about okay so why is this happening what sits beneath this no one no one um self-harms and i use self-harming as like the umbrella term from drinking too much eating too much um literally self-harming yourself no one does that because they're feeling good about themselves. Mm -hmm. Never. So I, I think it's about can, if you're with someone and, and maybe some people who are listening are with people who are behaving in those kind of self-sabotaging ways, the, the solution is to seek what lies beneath. And just saying to someone, oh, you really shouldn't be drinking so much. Not so helpful. Mm -hmm. you know? oh. yeah. yeah. Just stop. Yeah, all yeah. right then. I'll, I'll, I'll just get on with that. No, no problem. Yeah, easy. Uh, yeah, easy. How many, how many times did I say that? You know, just stop. You know, I, 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 yeah, just don't drink just for today. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you're um, like, that's my solution. Don't take that away from me. That takes the pain away. <laughs> It, but that's right, Nick. And, and that's the bit that people aren't understanding. They're not mm. understanding that it's the taking the pain away. And the minute you understand that, you have to then realize, ah, there's pain. Mm. And I think as human beings, if we've weren't learned nothing from this COVID, we should have learned compassion for each other. Mm. And, and, you know, as human beings, we are instinctively compassionate for each other. Um, and when people are in pain, you know, our, our response is generally to give a hug. And we have to give metaphorical hugs now because we can't do it in practice, but it's to, it's to just find empathy. And empathy is not sympathy, you know? Mm -hmm. Empathy is going, ah, oh, wow, that's gotta be tough. 
Mm. Wow. You know, let, let me sit with you with this. Let me, let me understand what that feels like. Um, rather than going, you, 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 there's that lovely bit of Brené Brown and Melissa, you, 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 I'm sure Nick, you've probably seen this, where she goes, where people talk about sympathy and they just silver line everything. Yeah. You know, and they go, oh, well, yeah, sure, you're drinking too much, but it's okay, at least you've got a job. Yeah. Great, that's the absolutely- What's needed. Yeah, useless, yeah. useless. Um, it's, so, um, it's so interesting how, how our intuitive nature is seen in mainstream, I would say, as counterintuitive, or where it's like, um, I, I don't know what it, what it speaks to, where somebody, where we feel like we need to offer the silver lining, like what I, I'm wondering what that does to us or how we've learned instead of saying, yeah, that sucks. Right. Like what makes us so uncomfortable about sitting with somebody in there? That's it. That, that's exactly it. Because maybe stuff is going to show up in me. All right. Yeah. That, that, that I don't want to go anywhere near. Mm -hmm. Or maybe my life isn't so great. Or do you know? Yeah. Um, like I, we don't want to be a mirror. We don't yeah. want to be a mirror. Yeah. Yeah. But actually, when you do empathy, you, you can't do empathy properly unless you choose vulnerability. You know, and you go, yeah, I, I, I feel you. Mm -hmm. and, and I love that expression, actually. That's such a great expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel you. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, it connects beautifully because that's literally what you're trying to do. You're trying to do that empathy and go, yeah, I, I feel you. I feel those experiences. I'm, 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 because why would we choose to feel something that's horrible and difficult and unpleasant? But if you're willing to do that, that's the power of that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and we need that in these times. We, we really need that. I'm, I'm going to disclose a, a, an emotion for 45 years of my life that I'm actually quite ashamed of. And that is that when, um, you know, I, 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 um, someone very close to me, you know, a member of my family was, was younger than me and they were coming to me in pain. And they were expressing that pain by lying. So they were like trying to embellish stories um, about how sick they were feeling, um, you know, some of their accomplishments because they were looking for love. Mm -hmm. And my reaction, because I could tell they were looking for sympathy, the way I was brought up was like, if someone's looking for sympathy, you don't give it to them. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, you know, grow up. You're not, you know, that's not, rather than that empathic thing of, hey, there's something wrong here for this person to be embellishing or because these were things that I did as a kid to look for sympathy. I would just lie just and make up stories. Mm. So there's this really kind of thing of like, you know, of, of our own journey to be able to be empathic. Cause I don't think it comes naturally anymore, you know, rather than, you know, it takes some work to actually go, sit with you and go, Oh yeah. brother, I, you know, I got your back, man. I've been there too. You know, I've, I've been to jail. I get that yeah. rather than going, Oh, just suck it up. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, you're right. You're right. I, I, I would offer you a bit of self-compassion here, Nick, mm -hmm. rather than judgment of self that you liberally just dropped in. <laughs> let's, let's have a little look at that. Um, to, okay. say, to say that, um, sorry, <laughs> habit Love of a lifetime. Mel Mel Melissa does it to me all the time. Uh, no, it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> That's what well, I'm here for. It's just to kind of go... And you were in pain too, you mm -hmm. know, and, 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 and all the messages and everything that you've been taught was so powerful at that moment that, that actually you did not have the resources to do that for that person. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that, you know, um, and find a way to forgive your 10 year old, 12 year old, 14 year old self. Because, it's so confusing. oh, sorry. No, no, go. I was just going to say, like, it's so amazing the meaning we attach to things that are not necessarily our identity, but just things we did because we were told to do. Sure. And like, when you do it, that when you see it that way, it's like you didn't know better because you weren't taught any differently. And it's so amazing to see where so much of the trauma shows up and the stuckness shows up in people mm -hmm. is that they're still attached to the story about themselves because they did a thing that they didn't know how to do differently. So the only reaction is like, judge it, be ashamed of it, hate yep. yourself for it. Other than like, 
And I did what I had to, I did what I, they told me to do. If I was told to be, to meet people with compassion and give a cookie, I, my brain would have been like, okay, this is what we do when this is a situation. So it's also, it's always so fascinating the, the, how we get attached to ourselves because of a thing we did. Mm. Um, I don't know. That's all I want to say. Yeah. And maybe, I mean, and that's powerful for, for where we are now. Mm. Because actually a lot of what we have been taught doesn't apply anymore. Right. So we, we're lost. Um, so, so, so how do we do it? But maybe I am an eternal optimist. Maybe yeah. here's the opportunities. Here's opportunity to maybe do things differently. Maybe here's opportunity to um, be compassionate for ourselves as we are compassionate for other people in, in difficult circumstances. I think the last time we spoke, Misha, you mentioned this thing, and I think it was March or April, around like the opportunity to be creative in our yeah. day and the work you do. And I and that stuck with me on some level. And I realized, you know, even well, very lo locked down, very limited. On a side note, I want to talk about fear and how it showed up for us. But before that, um, I found that even for me, what caused me comfort at some point was causing me disharmony. So mm -hmm. for example, and that's where I had to take in, well, be creative now with what causes you comfort or <laughs> brings you comfort. But as a very specific example, walking my dog along the same path every morning, knowing like it's 63 minutes, this is the street I take, this is the street I cross, caused me from my trauma experience, comfort, safety, peace, I could work within the container, I was good. Um, like, what are we, 1200 months into COVID? Yeah, at least. <laughs> it's like, if I do that same route one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm sure. going to chop down the tree that I used to hug. <laughs> I'm going to sell my dog. Like, I just went, I just spiraled into the parts of me. So then I was like, well, Let's try this, just inviting. Maybe creativity is not the right word, but it I invite is. a different route, right? Yeah, I'm like yeah. going down that street or instead of the coffee shop you like all the time, go to try that one. Like get uncomfortable, get mm -hmm. comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's been the whole, like, the whole year. Um, <laughs> I caught myself for the whole year. You, you almost said, you almost said. <laughs> <I did>, <laughs> So I appreciate that. And I think that's such an important piece. And especially with a lot of the work I'm doing for folks now is like, how can we be creative in bringing joy and peace in different ways that we didn't think could bring us joy and yeah. peace, but the things that bring us comfort no longer, we we're different. The world is different. We can't yeah. expect ourselves to operate the same ways. But I mean, I, I agree with you and, and I understand what you're saying in terms of you know, it, it seems like it's a small thing, but it's important. So um, building on the walking theme, there's a park really near me that I would never go to. It, it, it is there, but I'm like, nah. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a bit dodgy, wasn't too sure about it. I certainly would never go there by myself. Now it's like, yep, I'm going, there it is. And it's like, oh, actually it's really lovely. And it's great and it's around the corner and why why did i not go before um mm. but you have to and and recognize that when you move to a place of newness uncertainty your mind is going to lob those alert alarm watch out be careful thoughts and you just go oh okay mine cheers i see you yeah. thanks for that mm -hmm. i'm going to carry on walking and, and it's in that acknowledgement that your mind is just trying to keep you safe because that's what minds do. Um, but rather than getting caught up and then dragged back by the alert alarm. So if I'm not acknowledging it and then these difficult thoughts and feelings rock up, I might go, oh, no, I can't do that. But if we go, well, of course, my mind's going to throw me this because I'm doing something different. And that's what minds do. Yeah. and you have a different conversation with yourself you go, ah I talk to myself ah cheers for that mine you just sent me yeah. that all right yeah thanks I hear you mm -hmm. but it kind of unhooks you you know it gives you a little bit of distance and then once you've done that then actually funnily enough your mind calms down a little bit and stops mm -hmm. sending you that stuff yeah. and then I you know I'd imagine Melissa in your context 
once you've done changing that route once, well, now you can change it all the time and it's no biggie. Yeah, I change it like three times a day because yeah. I'm like, actually look at all the opportunities. Yeah. And from, from whatever COVID has presented us with, I think in my understanding, it's been a revel, it's, it's revealed a lot. It's a yeah. re revealed a lot about what we are afraid of, what we are attaching ourselves to, mm -hmm. what keeps us stuck. And also on the flip side, what, what we think keeps us safe. And yep. some that safety could be the thoughts are there, but I'm just going to ignore it, ignore it. And we know all of us in this space. And I'm sure people listening is you can't ignore it for, so, for too long because it finds a way yep. to make an appearance. And whether that's in sickness, whether that's in any kind of form, it finds its way until we kind of turn to it. And, and like you said, like, hey, I see you. What's up? You want some tea? Just sit yeah. for a second. Let me, yeah. let me do my thing. Come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I love that. I mean, that's that that's that's beautiful. That yeah, let's just have a yeah, calm, calm. Yeah, cup of tea, chill. Yeah, we all feel better with a cup of tea. So maybe right. that's it. Maybe. Um, Maybe that's it. We need to sit down and have a cup of tea with ourselves. <laughs> really, you know, one like of the, the hardest things. Sorry, go on, Nick. No, one of the things that you taught me, Melissa, was like this. And I know you wanted to kind of address fear, but this and I'm trying to I'm, in my mind, I'm putting together compassion and fear and how to get to compassion through our fears. And when when I was when I would tell Melissa that I'm scared of something, she was like, Nick, are you really scared of it? Mm -hmm. And she uses this phrase of like, or is just fear present? you know is fear pre just present in you and she would say to me say nick ask that scared nick you know nick who's scared of being alone what what are you trying to teach me yeah. and i think that this has given me a practice of going am i actually really physically scared or is is fear manifesting itself in a lesson to be learned mm. right mm -hmm. um so thanks for that melissa <laughs> <laughs> but, like, but I, yeah um, and that, that's the kind of thing of like is it, you know have a cup of tea with your fear just going what are you trying to teach me yeah well that's yeah, like yeah. very buddhist uh philosophy right sit down with your demons because mm. that's and whatever shadow work energy work it's that's what is needed is all the yelling all the anger is just saying what we talked about before there's pain so the mm. anger is this companion this champion for the pain so if we meet the pain then the anger is like i guess i don't have that much of a role anymore because i did my job yeah i made you pay attention right yeah and when you yeah. think of things that way it's kind of like nothing's actively working against you mm. even your emotions and i think it's really fascinating the sports world too we're meant to separate the emotions is a weakness mm. which maybe it is i don't know but it's also like why compartmentalize why not take the whole what so are i i i try to debunk that myth mm. yeah you know, but yes They've been taught that you should just be able to not feel anything. And I, I call bullshit on it. I go, that's impossible because then also they feel less than because they're not able to do it. So judgment rocks up, you know, but it's like, so I'm going to say, right. This is a difficult, challenging situation. What do our minds do when we're faced with this? They go alert, alarm, watch out, be careful because they're trying to protect us. Mm. so that's a, that's the starting point for normality and then you go so now you need to have the cup of tea with yourself <laughs> yeah. and then you get perspective rather than being caught up like this or just trying to push it away you know mm. most people it's like they're they're struggling so they push it away and they push it away it's exhausting mm -hmm. drop the struggle mm -hmm. oh okay and the, you know this is this is you know, from the acceptance commitment therapy, I've learned mm. so much around that, which is like, um, when difficult thoughts and feelings show up, a lot of people push them away, they struggle with it. And that just perpetuates them, that just keeps them hanging around, rather than having a cup of tea and going, oh, that showed up. Interesting. Yeah. Well, what was that saying about thing? And, and, and you're right, Nick, you know, my very, very favorite question that I ask athletes is, okay, so what did that teach you? Mm. No judgment. Just what did that teach you? And, mm. and trying to, I'm, I'm in a new club now, I've been there since August and, you know, and, and, and the, the ethos and working with the players around 
getting them to understand, okay, here's an experience. It was difficult. It was a challenging, but you've got some, there's some nuggets in there. There's some gold in there. Let's, let's find the gold, find the treasure. Um, it's always there. It's like lo lo losing isn't losing. Losing is learning, right? Absolutely. And it's that change, change of mindset. Of yeah, like, yeah, I didn't yeah, lose, yeah. I, I didn't lose, lose. I just didn't show up to yeah. the best of my ability. So what do I have to learn to make sure that next time I can show up? Yeah. And I'm, I'm working at the moment with Wickham Wanderers, who are bottom of the championship. They just went up from League One. They're a tiny club. They're an amazing club. And I've worked with many of the people there for, for a while. And, you know, at the beginning of the season, one of the things that we worked with, kind of, I had this idea around, okay, how do, how do, we, how do we have a metaphor for our journey? What do we do? And um, uh, my brain works in random ways, as you know, Nick. So Captain Cook's, Voyage of Discovery came into my mind. Mm -hmm. And if we look at what the, the four ships were named, they were named Endeavour, they were named um, Discovery, they were named, um, oh, why can't I remember the other ones now? Um, Perseverance, you know, something, it wasn't Perseverance, it was around that. So we're kind of using these, um, an adventure was one. So we're mm -hmm. kind of using these ships as a metaphor for our season because Wickham Wanderers have never been in the championship before they've never been here so this is uncharted waters so can we apply endeavor we know that it's going to be bumpy but actually if we don't learn we will just feel emotional overload so every time it's like what did that teach us what have we learned from that what have we gained from that no judgment just experiential learning um and go on our journey because it's a new journey we can discover and we have discovered all sorts of fantastic things along the way it's it's also it's just interesting because the more we learn how to what we've learned and how to sit with ourselves the more able we are to sit with somebody else in their pain like kind of coming full circle to the beginning of the conversation which is like we don't want to sit with or we can't we don't have the city to sit with somebody in their pain because of what it might bring up for us yeah yeah but at the same time if we're learning the tools to be able to have the conversation with ourselves and not from a place of shame mm. but a place from like what did I learn from this again oh yeah and then we could recognize that pain or that learning or that stuckness in somebody else then it doesn't become about like their pain is a reflection of my worth or my inability it just becomes they're in pain and yeah. so uh, let me be with them in that pain and that's kind of what we need also right now in this world spores in all kind of facets is like can we just sit with people in their pain without needing to answer because we don't have answers not all no, of us need to answer no. anything right now yeah yeah you're right and and sometimes if we can't do it verbally maybe we can do it other ways mm. so maybe you can draw it you know the power of that kind of expression um and you go, oh, I can't, I'm, I'm no good at drawing. Doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, even if it's just scribbling red and purple and something on a page that says, this is how I feel right now. Mm -hmm. That's exceptionally powerful. So, you know, we think that we have to have, you know, kind of linguistic gymnastics to explain what's happening to us right. emotionally. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, you know, some of us are trained in linguistic gymnastics. I myself am a practicing, practicing <laughs> artist of linguistic gymnastics. I think I've just made that up. But, um, but, but yeah. don't underestimate other forms of expression, you know, other forms of, of, of accessing and, and sitting with yourself. You know, you can do it through many, many different ways. Mm. Um, I just creative. Yes, yeah. just because it was right beside me, I'm not kidding. I bought this for myself at a pound shop. Okay, and lovely. And just because I was having a really rough day and I yeah. was cranky and irritated at everything and nothing was ever, there was no silver lining, you didn't matter. But I saw this little thing. Unicorn. Unicorn. I think and it, it is. Like, oh, I remember feeling a way about whatever this thing is trying to experience. So I bought it for like a pound and I yeah. put it on my desk right beside me, which is why I accessed it so easily. But it's become like a symbol also of like, of just put possibility, hope, and also that things change. Yeah. Like I would have laughed at myself if I bought this. And now it's like, nope, I need my little unicorn because it's 
And even when I'm doing groups virtually, I've told everybody about it. And sometimes when it gets really intense, you know, this thing makes an appearance and it yeah. just interrupts. It interrupts what's happening because it's like, yeah, it's the remembering of yeah. creativity, of different ways of expressing. I'm trying yeah. to link this. It made sense in my brain. Mm. When you no, were no, talking. I understand. I, I might be rambling, but it is, we can have symbolic yeah. or like tangible things to help us remember that we've come out of something. Like that day was shit mm. and not so, so much anymore. And this is my little token yeah. of that. That's yeah, what I yeah, Nick, sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. But it, but it is so, it is so powerful, you mm-hmm. know, to do that. And some of us need to express ourselves through our bodies. Yeah. You know, you're feeling angry. I don't know. Put on some record and just move. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, the, there are many ways. Mm. All of them important. Mm-hmm. So right at the beginning of, of this, you talked about compassion and how we need to start showing more compassion for each other. And mm-hmm. then from this, I'm, I'm gathering that we can't really show compassion unless we can show compassion for ourselves. And so, so this kind of brings us down to like some self-care. You know, I know and this mm-hmm. is the, the big topic that me and Melissa are working on with organizations is that, you know, how to say, you know, I, for me, my language towards a guy who sits in a body that looks like mine, that's 50 mm-hmm. years old, that's been taught the old ways showing self-care mm. for for each other like I, I always thought that that was like selfish and weak mm. and um and now what I have learned is that self-care isn't you know and it's part of I've, I've got to look after myself so that I can help others um so kind of can you describe how you would try to help some people get around the notion that self-care is selfish and and that it's actually compassion and in order for you to make the world a better place you need to practice this first yeah it's um it's interesting that it so compassion sometimes is around forgiveness you know and and sometimes it's about forgiving the child in you you know particularly when we've experienced trauma as young as young kids um i do however i do think that you can be compassionate to somebody else without actually ever having been compassionate to yourself um because I think sometimes it's a it it can be a nice little bit of deflection you know Mm. and it's like I can show compassion to yourself meanwhile I can still hold on to a whole load of shit that's really I should have let go of or forgiven myself for um but you're right in terms of understanding you know how that manifests and and maybe there are people who've lost people you know and grieving and and understanding how to grieve is a form of being compassionate to yourself and and understanding that you 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 can give those emotions space and actually why why would you not be feeling pain of course you'd be feeling pain To, to deny your pain i think that's also melissa what you were saying to deny your pain is where the problems really begin you know, because you go, yeah, sure, I'm fine. Yeah, carry on. Everything's groovy rather than going, yeah, actually, I'm really hurting right now. Um, and that's brave. And that's the thing that I think people misunderstand. And certainly in, in the world that I work in, and it's driven me berserk over many years. They think that the work that I do is, oh, it's easy. It's just a little put an arm around someone and it's nice and soft and it's all, oh my God, the, the, the hardest stuff those men do with me it is the work they do with me. It's easy to go and run yourself into the ground compared with going, actually, I'm really scared. Mm. Um. So, you know, make no mistake about where the bravery lies. You know, the bravery always lies in vulnerability. And more so, you know, when men have been taught, as you were taught, you have to be strong and real men don't cry and this, that and the other. And the kind of derision around, you know, being a mummy's boy or a soft boy and all of that stuff, which is, you know is setting up a world of pain actually for young men i think um yeah 
Nick, do you want to follow up with that? No, I'm just glad. It, it, I think it has set up a world of pain and I'm mm -hmm. so grateful that people like the three of us are talking about it so that there is a new generation of young men who can go, oh, I'm, you know, this, this was what was taught to these guys who came before me because it is all like a, you know, our grandparents were coming out of a war. So the sure. things were different then. And they had the, you know, the nuclear family of the fifties and sixties was different then. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the seventies and eighties and my dad coming from a coal mining village, things were different then. And I, and now things are different now. And I think that slowly we can start to guide um you know young adults uh, especially in the sporting world if that's where our, our kind of expertise lies mm -hmm. um but also in the corporate environment that we've yeah, been working it's with the over same. the last it, yeah. it's the same that that uh i mean it's interesting one of my one of my daughter's friends is working in corporate law and is exhausted and you know working till stupid o'clock at night and i'm going why is she doing that well, yeah. it's that ridiculous yeah. culture that men put in place. Right. Basically, they put it in place so that they wouldn't have to go home to their families. Um, and uh, if you're if you're if you're clocking off at five o'clock, somehow you are not working hard enough. But actually, yeah. we all know that if you're working twelve hours a day or plus, the quality of what you're doing mm -hmm. is a pile of rubbish. Yeah. Um, but it's that you macho spend two hours culture. In the pub. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. that macho culture, isn't it? And yeah. and feeling that if you, you know, so you that conformity and power over and how hierarchical structures are set up within corporate mm -hmm. organizations. So someone can be a complete dickhead, but because he has this label, um, your boss on his head or her head. Apparently they can treat you like a piece of shit. Mm -hmm. What? I, I remember once um, having an issue with someone I was working with and someone said to me, and I was calling them out and I was going, this is unacceptable. You cannot speak to me like this. And someone said to me, but they're your superior. I'm like, no, 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 no. No one is superior to me. Mm -hmm. We are, we are all the same. They just have that label on, they're doing that job, but they are never my superior. Um, but we learn somehow that deferential, you know, yes, boss. All, how is that going to empower anyone? And then what happens is that when you've climbed that corporate ladder, whatever the hell that might be, mm -hmm. you, you do payback on some mm -hmm. poor, innocent 20 year old mm -hmm. because it makes you feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're doing what you were taught as well, which is to cause harm. So we cause harm or, yep. or people up because yeah. It's like we created the environment for pain. Then we feel shame within ourselves for needing ways to deal and work with the pain. But then we just need other people to feel the same pain to somehow validate our own pain. It's like this really vicious, vicious like, cycle. Yeah. And it, it almost feels like, uh, like there's on the flip side, there's like this safety in thinking that time and life and jobs and careers and love is linear. So it's like that ladder, because it makes sense, you know, this is a step and this is a step. And I think we all know that healing, love, relationship, life is so nonlinear. Yeah. But and we don't have the skills or language to say, well, yeah, it's five steps forward, 10 steps back, or one step forward, 15 steps back, that we think we're doing something wrong because our navigation of this world is very nonlinear. But everyone's saying that linear is the way to do it. it feels like there's such a disconnect between men like you, Nick, who, um, not to blame you, but who created this infrastructure. And then now it's like, okay, peace out. I'm going to go keep doing my thing. And everyone's like, well, well, now what? Feeling like they're doing something wrong when it's not. It's like the relationship between the individual and then what they're coming up against in terms of this linear, right? The nonlinear and the linear colliding. That's all I want to say. Makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that it is uh, just, a, and I'll give you the final word, Misha, but you know, just a, a time where now, like this is a, the word I think that me and Melissa have been looking for a long time, well, for the last couple of weeks and months and what we're doing is like a reframing, you know, a reframing of the environments that we work in, the ecosystems that we work in, that we live in, um, to create spaces for people to become more compassionate. And I don't think it's going to be hard. I think that because of what's going on in the world, I think that the cell is actually going to be like, hey, do you want to try something that we know is working with other people? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's thanks to you and the lessons that, that I learned from you and all of your experience that, that just 
it just reemphasizes and reestablishes that what we're doing, we're on the right path. Mm. Um, so thank you. But thank you. Thank you. Lovely people. Lovely, lovely people. My, my world is better with you in it. Uh, likewise, yeah. likewise. So um, I know we're going to catch up again tomorrow. So uh, oh, are, we, we, are we going to do that or are we going yeah, to? Do you want to do that tomorrow? Can we do it now? <laughs> stop, press, stop, 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 the, record. stop the Facebook. Sure. Yeah, stop the Facebook. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. we can do that. So I'll thank everybody because we have come to our 45 minutes. So thank everybody that what's on the Elephant and Castle Facebook page. Uh, we'll see you uh, Thursday for the workshop. Um, and thank you again, uh, Misha. And thank you, Mel. And I'm going to end the Facebook thing now. We'll see you all later. Bye.